This is a Faith Defenders audio presentation with author, lecturer, and Christian apologist, Dr. Bob Morey. If you would turn with me to the Gospel of John. There are four Gospels because there were four themes. Matthew wrote to the Jews and explaining what did Jesus say. Thus, it is no surprise that almost 70% of Matthew is a record or a summary of what Jesus said. Mark answers the question, what did Jesus do? And he had in mind the Italian soldiers that had overrun the country. Luke answers the question, who followed him? And he had in mind the Greeks. But when we come to the Gospel of John, it is unique in that it was written to Christians. And it was written specifically to remind us that the baby who was born of the Virgin Mary did not begin with conception. This is why John emphasizes the pre-existence and eternity of the Word, the Logos of God. John chapter 1 and verse 1, from the Greek it says, when the beginning began. He uses the word arche, A-R-C-H-E, which is the first word to be found in the Greek Septuagint of the Old Testament. This takes us right back to the day of creation, the day that God created the heavens and the earth. Bereshit bara Elohim hashemayim v'charetz. When the beginning began, says Moses in Genesis 1.1, out of nothing, God created the heavens, Hashemayim, and the earth. The Apostle John wants us to go back to the very beginning of all things, the beginning of the space-time continuum that you and I exist in, the beginning of human history, the beginning of matter, the beginning of spirit, the beginning of everything. And he says, do you know when the beginning began, the Word already was in existence. If you'll notice the word was, the tense in the Greek means, listen, when you go back to the beginning, to the creation itself, do not for one moment think that Jesus Christ began there. Now, of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Unitarians, the Socinians, the Way International, and a thousand other cults, deny the pre-existence of Jesus, and they either say he did not exist before his inception in the womb, or they say he was created at the beginning. But you will notice it does not say in the beginning the word became or the word was created. The word was in the Greek means when the beginning began, the word was already in existence. As a matter of fact, the Word was the one who created everything. Verse 3, all things came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Verse 3 makes it abundantly clear that Jesus Christ is not a thing. If He created all things that came into being, then He Himself is not a thing that came into being. Thus, the pre-existence of the Word, the fact that the Word was eternal. Now, the phrase, the Lagos, the Word, is picked up from the Aramaic Targums, one of the intertestamental translations of the Old Testament that was done by the Jews. When the people in captivity no longer understood Hebrew, they translated the Old Testament to accommodate themselves to the languages the people knew. So there was a translation into the Greek, which we called the Septuagint, different translations, different versions of that. They also translated it into the Aramaic, called the Targums. And in the Aramaic Targums, we read that in the beginning, the Word, the Minma, created the heavens and the earth. The very expression and revelation of God is the one who created the universe. You see, your words 
reveal who and what you really are. Yes, they do. If you never say to your husband or to your wife, I love you, never say it. Don't pretend that you do. Your words which come from your mouth ultimately reveal your heart. The same thing with God. The way God reveals himself is by speaking, his speech. And in this metaphor, figure of speech, the Messiah was called in Jewish theology before Jesus was ever born. He is the minma, the word, the one who is the full revelation of the mind, the heart, and the will of God. And when the beginning, capital B, began, the Word was already there. The Word was the Creator. The Word brought everything into being. He was before all things. He himself is the Creator of all things. Thus, he himself is not a thing. And this is important, you see, for a Savior who is not quite God or not quite man would be a bridge broken at either end. Of what use is a bridge that one end doesn't extend to the other side? You say, well, that doesn't do anybody any good. Well, see, this was the genius of the Hebrew religion of which Christianity is simply the fulfillment of. Christianity is simply Messianic Judaism. It was originally called the way. You may be a Gentile by race, but you're a Jew by grace. If you love that Jewish Messiah, you love the Jewish scriptures, you are Jewish whether you know it or not. And the genius was to say there was someone coming who was man of every man, who thus could represent us to God. We need someone to come in our place as our intercessor, as our mediator, who can go to God and ask him that he would forgive us, that he would have mercy on us. I mean, we would like to go ourselves, but we would probably end up a grease stain because we're so wicked and so unholy and so perverse and so depraved that if we tried to go into the presence of God, we saw what happened in the Old Testament when these foolish people tramped into the Holy of Holies, a fire belched out of the Ark of the Covenant and consumed them. And even when that guy touched the Ark, just to steady it, he was struck dead. So... You know, well, we don't really want to go into the presence of God. We have to have someone who will go who's a perfect man, who's a sinless man. Someone who can stand before the omniscient eye of God without blemish, without guilt, who will be man, a very man, truly human, but without sin. And, of course, when we looked around, we couldn't find anybody. God had to provide this perfect man, this sinless man, who would be man's representative. This is why we are told in verse 14, the minma in Aramaic, the word lagos, became flesh. That's where we get the word incarnation. Just as in Spanish, you have carne. And it's incarnation, and he dwelt among us. The Greek says he tabernacled among us. Very important word. It is a word in the Greek Septuagint which, which was used to describe how the Shekinah glory of God came into the tabernacle tent and filled that tent with his glory. Jesus Christ should be viewed as the very glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God, the outshining, the effulgence of the very nature of deity that has tabernacled among us in a human body. Just like the glory of God came into the temple and came into the tabernacle, you must understand he was Emmanuel, God manifested in the flesh right in that body that came through 
the womb of the Virgin Mary. He tabernacled among us, and we saw his what? Doxa, his glory, the Shekinah glory of God. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of two things. Well, what did he have that we need? We need two things, people. We need grace, and we need truth. Well, why do we need those things? Well, one, we're sinners, and we're going to say, oh, God, please have grace and mercy upon us. Don't zap us now. If God were to be just this morning, the ground would open and swallow us all up. Say amen, somebody. Some of you could feel the flames licking your feet this morning. <laughs> when you think about what you did last night. You see, we need grace, unmerited favor. We can't earn it. You can't pay God off. It's, you know, like the Godfather and the Mafia Don. He dies. They go to the priest. They say, hey, we need a high mass, and we know the saying, high mass, high money, low mass, low money, no money, no mass. We want a high mass. A lot of candles got to be lit here. Yeah, but the guy was a murderer. So I'd give a little bit more. What, you need another gold statue, a few jewels? You want me to gild something? Hey, you can't pay God off. Neither can you merit salvation as if you can be good enough. You can't. Can't be good enough. Can't be nice enough. You say, but I'm a nice person. Yeah, nice people go to hell, too. <laughs> That's why it's the word grace. He came full of grace, which is unmerited favor, because we couldn't merit it. Jesus Christ merited everything we need in order to be saved from our own sins and iniquity. So Jesus Christ came to earth through the womb of the Virgin Mary. We saw his glory, that he was the Shekinah glory of God that tabernacled among us. And he came full of grace, because we need it. We need grace, unmerited favor. And he was also full of truth. Why? Because we are filled with darkness and lies and stupidity and ignorance and speculation and superstition. This is why natural theology actually doesn't work. In my series on natural theology where I reveal that it simply doesn't work, wherever man has been isolated and was not exposed to the Bible, was not exposed to the Hebrew Scriptures, never heard of Moses, the Ten Commandments, never knew of the law of God. Man isolated from revealed religion. All he had was looking up at the stars, looking at tree stumps, picking up a rock. What did he come up with? Horrible things. The Mayans and the Aztecs would cut the beating heart out of the chest of someone. Human sacrifice cannibalism, immorality, murder, rape, infanticide, taking your babies and putting them out to be eaten by the animals and the ants. You see, we need truth. And Jesus Christ came to bring us the truth so much he said, I am the truth. I am the truth. Without me, you won't know anything about the Father. I am the way. Without me, babes, you're not going. And I'm the life. Without me, there is no living before the Father. So the Word who became flesh, who tabernacled among us, who was the Shekinah glory of God, now in human form, came full of grace and truth. It is this Word which already existed at the creation, who was the creator of all things. He himself could not therefore be a thing because, you see, it would be a bridge broken on this end if he wasn't fully human 
And on the other end, it would be broken if he were not fully God. That's why John goes on. He says, when the beginning began, the word already was. So forget about the idea he was created, he was an angel. He's a thing. He's not a thing. He is eternal. And the word was in a face-to-face -face relationship with God the Father. The word with is emphatic, meaning in a personal, intimate relationship with God. And we know this is a reference to the Father from verse 18. He who is in the bosom of the Father. So it's God the Father. Jesus was in an eternal, personal relationship with God the Father from all eternity. But then John says, not only is that cool already, eternal, eternally intimate in his relationship with the Father, but he himself, in terms of his nature, was God, that is, was deity. Now, in the Greek, it is a different word order. In the Greek language in the first century, the Koine Greek, whenever you wanted the reader who would read this out loud, and the Bible was actually written to be read out loud. Remember, there were no uh, printing presses. There were just hand-written uh, scrolls, very expensive. They would be kept in the synagogue, kept in the church. You didn't march around with 66 scrolls and a knapsack. It's not how it worked. It was read. Well, how could you indicate or mark to someone that they would emphasize a word? Well, the Greeks devised this. We will take a word out of the normal word order. That is, in the sentence, this is where the word should be. We'll take it out of its natural place and we'll put it to the front of the sentence where it shouldn't be. That will tip the public reader off that when he comes to that word, he's to emphasize it. He's to say it with strength and vigor. So as you read this in the original, when the beginning began, the word already was. And the Word was in a relationship with God, and the Word was God! Because he took the word God out of its normal place and put it to the first so that the reader would emphasize he had now reached the very climax, as if the cymbals, bang! You know how the orchestra goes. And at this point, the drum would roll and the cymbals would clang because this whole understanding of the nature of Messiah, that he was not created, that he was eternal, that he was the one who created all things. He was in a personal relationship with God and he himself, as to his nature, was true deity. That is the emphasis and the climax and that is where the story took us. Because a Savior who was not quite God as well as not quite man would be of no use. We needed a perfect man, and Jesus Christ knew no sin. He was the spotless, innocent Lamb of God. He said, which of you can convict me of sin? Paul says, he who knew no sin. The author of Hebrews says, he knew no sin. He was the perfect man. Thus, he lived the life we should have lived. And he died the death we should have died. And he merited eternal life. And by his merits, we can be saved. We can't be saved by our works. We're saved by his. We ain't got any, by the way. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. So get the foolish idea out of your head that you're good and kind. You're not. When God looks at you, he sees through the hypocrisy, the sham, he sees you as you really are, a sinner in need of salvation. But you see, the Messiah must also be God. The Savior must also be God because we need God to come to us. We need to go to God and we need God to come to us and thus God came to us through the in. Incarnation. 
This is why in verse 16, for of his fullness we have all received. This is, by the way, you say, well, Dr. Bob, why did you say that it's written to Christians? Well, these are some of the tips. It's internal evidence. He says of his fullness, some people over there received. No, we, all of us received. All of humanity? No. We Christians have accepted the Lord. And of his fullness we have received, because it says he's full, there's the word plenorva, full of grace and truth, and of that fullness we received it. Matter of fact, it wasn't a one-time inoculation of grace. See, being saved is not a one-time thing. The New Testament uses that word for salvation, so terra. It uses it in three senses. We were saved, we are being saved, we shall be saved. That's why he says, listen, his fullness we've all received and grace upon what? Grace. Grace. You say, what does that mean, Dr. Bob? Very simply. Do you need grace today that God doesn't fry you like in a big daddy fryer? I need grace. I need unmerited favor. How many of you think you merited God's salvation today? If you think you do, there's a fool born every minute, and actually you belong over at TVN, not here. They're able to, you know, shyst you and get all your money away from you. Here, my people are too smart. If I tried to trick them and do, I saw a 90-foot Jesus who said he would kill me unless you give me millions. My people would say, die, pastor, die. <laughs> if I told you I had a little hanky and for five dollars you could put your, you'd say, no thanks, I have tissues. I can't, this group is going to be deceived, you see. You never merited salvation to begin with. You will never merit it as long as you live. Don't think, well, I was saved and now I'm, I'm goody two shoes and holy Joe. You needed grace yesterday. What do you need today? Grace. And what you're going to need tomorrow, babes? Grace! Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. But where does the grace come from? Hamashia Baruch Hashem Yezu Christu. The grace that we need every day comes through the Lord Jesus Christ who is full of it. Plenora, packed, and he never runs dry. See, that's why he has to be God. If he is not also infinite in his grace, he would run out. Imagine and say, Lord! Forgive me! Oh, I'm sorry. I'm out of grace today. I mean, I ran out at 3 o'clock. There was a big sinner down there in Vegas, and he just used it right up. No. You can never empty the fullness of Jesus Christ. He is God, a very God, as well as man, a very man. See, this is why John is saying, listen, don't you understand? He was from all eternity. He was true deity. It's because he's true deity, he's full of grace and truth. It's infinite. It is an inexhaustible fullness. And we receive that every day, grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. This is why when John tells us, verse 10, the Word was in the world. Now, the world was made by him, but the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people, the Jews, and those who were his own people, they did not by and large receive him. Oh, many did. Today, more Jews are believing in Yeshua than believed in the first century. There's a revival going on in Israel. There are more Jewish people coming to know Christ today. There are Messianic congregations sprouting up all over the place. But by and large, they didn't. Then we come to the butology, verse 12. But, but, 
as many as what? Received him. The Greek word lambano, lambano, L-A-M-B-A-N-O, for those taking notes, lambano. Lambano means more than simply believing something. Now, I'll have here Clark to be a good example of this. Now, I could say, now, Clark, mm, I have this for you. Mm, I bought it for you. Mm, I paid at Walmart for it. Mm, I paid a dollar. Mm, it has your name on it. Mm, it belonged to you. Mm. Now, he could say, I believe, Dr. Bob. I believe it now. But if he does not lambano it, reach out and take it, is it his? You say, this is the problem we have during this Christmas season. Many of the sea and eaters, Christmas and Easter people, they show up Christmas and Easter because they show up at the cradle and they show up at the crib. They say, I believe. I said, do you believe in Jesus? Mm. Christ came. Mm. He's the Son of God. Mm. And you have people who think they're going to heaven because like the little do the dog with the spring, the head in the back of the car. Do <laughs> you believe in God the Father? Mm. Maker of heaven and... Mm. <laughs> So John, John is very wise. He said, in order for you to become a child of God, it's not as simple as believing in the sense of intellectual assent. Faith is more than that. That's why Reformed theology tells us that faith is, involves three things. Ascensus in Latin, meaning intellectual assent, it also refers to knowledge, that you understand what you are intellectually accepting, but a personal taking of Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. He said, as many as received him who took him. It's not enough to say, well, I believe him. If you don't receive the Lord into your life, into your heart as your king, your Lord of lords, your master, your guru, as many as received him, to them he gave the privilege of becoming a child of God. This is what it means to believe in his name. See, John says, you know, you've got to understand this. The wondrous work of redemption has been done. The Messiah came. He was man of every man. He tabernacled in a body. He was the Shekinah glory of God. He is the perfect man who represented us before God as the high priest. He's our representative. He could go into the presence of God for us and plead our case. He's also God who's come to earth, and he can come before us and plead the cause of God and tell us the truth. But all of that cannot save you unless you individually, lambano, take, receive Jesus Christ. He said, this is really what it means to, this is what it means to believe in him. As a result, there's regeneration for you. You are born, not of bloods, it's in the plural, meaning you're not going to be saved just because your parents are Christians, your grandparents. God has no grandchildren. Better write that down. God has no grandchildren. He has children. You're not going to heaven because your mom or your dad loves the Lord. If you don't love the Lord, you're going down to the other levels. You ain't going up to glory land. He says, who were born not of bloods nor of the will of the flesh, you will never receive Jesus Christ unassisted, on your own, if the Holy Spirit does not do a work in your heart, you don't 
want him. Because by nature, we love our sin. We say to Jesus, bug off. I want to live my own life. For all of us, our sheep who have gone astray, we all want our own way. Well, then how is it that you could ever want the way of Christ? God has to work that in you. It's called the work of the Holy Spirit, where he regenerates you. And thus, your being saved is not the result. Your receiving Christ is not the result of a decision made by your depraved nature, because left up to yourself, you would never bow the knee to God. That's how bad we are. He said, nor of the will of man. Because our depraved nature, the flesh, is so depraved, we would never make that decision to receive Christ. He said, and neither should you think, like the pagans, that you've got some kind of free will running around. And of course, the theory of free will is fallen upon hard times. People are slowly beginning to understand your nature determines your choices. When you go to Baskin and Robbins and you look at the 31 flavors or how many they have now, do you just close your eyes and point somewhere on that? No. You choose according to your likes, your dislikes, how you were raised. Maybe your mom always bought vanilla. That's all you ever had was vanilla. And you look at these, what, what is that? German chocolate cherry cake? Ew. Just give me vanilla. You see, it's a little tricky. Now, the Greeks thought, oh, we're, we're totally free. We are little gods. We have no influences. We just... Uh, no. He says, don't think that you're being saved as a result of the will of a man. Your will, your ability to choose has nothing to do with regeneration. The reason you received him, the reason you were regenerated was not of bloods, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of what? Of God. Of God. Salvation is the work of God. It is not the work of man. Salvation was planned by God the Father, executed by God the Son, and applied by God the Holy Spirit, blessed God, three in one. It takes the entire Trinity to save one sinner. The entire Trinity is involved in our salvation. That's why we sing, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, world without end. Amen and amen. This then is the message of Christmas. Because we could not save ourselves, God came to save us. Christ came as man of very man to represent us before the Father, and he now stands at the right hand of the Father, and he shows his wounds and calls us his own. He's also God of very God, so as God's representative, he came to us so we could see what God is like. And Jesus said, who, who sees me sees the Father also. Have you received the Lord? I didn't ask you, do you intellectually assent that he is the Son of God. I believe in God the Father, the Almighty Maker of heaven. Yeah, I, I understand all that. But have you, at some point, said, Jesus, I receive you as my Lord, my Savior, my King, my Master, my Boss. I give my life to you. That's when Christmas happens in the heart. There was no room for him in the manger, but it's when you say, yes, Lord Jesus, there is room for you in my heart. Don't forget during this Christmas season, Jesus can be born in your heart if you receive him, lambano. You take him into your heart and become a child of God. Father, we thank you for the Apostle John that you moved him to write this marvelous gospel, written to us Christians to remind us of the incarnation, the deity, the preexistence, the eternity, 
the creatorhood of Messiah, Baruch Hashem HaMashiach, that he was God of very God, man of very man, light of very light, and how that the infinite contracted to the finite span of a woman's womb and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. May Christ be born in the hearts of sinners today, and they will become children of God. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You have come to the end of this lecture. To continue with the series, please listen to the next lecture.